Hi, everyone, and welcome to AXA Coral Live. It's fantastic to have you all with us for this live lesson on the human impact on the coral reef. Personally, I find this the trickiest uh, lesson that we do as part of Coral Live, and we'll try and get that balance right between some of the negative impacts that humans have had on the reef and the hope and the action that we can take to preserve this amazing environment for future generations. Now, normally we get out into the world and we go and go to the coral reef, work with the researchers and bring that to you. But I'm delighted today, uh, although we haven't been able to get out to Curaçao this year, our current base uh, for Coral Live and the Kamabi Research Station because of the coronavirus pandemic, I'm delighted that we are joined today um, by Sarah Cryer from the National Oceanography Centre here in the UK. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. Um, we'll come back and Sarah will be answering some of your questions and giving a bit more detail about her work in just a bit. But it's been wonderful that the National Marine Aquarium and I'm here at the Great Barrier Reef exhibit have, have stepped in and are hosting us for this week. Uh, the National Marine Aquarium is run by the Ocean Conservation Trust and they not only perform this wonderful public engagement work, but also do research and conservation activities themselves, particularly with seagrass working to bring these wonderful underwater meadows back to their former glory. But this lesson is looking at not just the wonder of the coral reef, and I know that we've, we've been talking about that, the adaptation, the food webs, all this kind of thing this week. But we're now going to look at how fragile uh, the coral reef might be. And we're going to do that uh, in a couple of ways. We've got a couple of activities uh, coming up for you. So the activities will form the sort of first part of this live lesson. And they will come on to the Q&A section. And, and I know that Sarah's got some fantastic video to share with you to show how the activities that we do actually also relates to science that scientists are doing um, in the real world as on the coral reef. Before we start, um, we have some shout outs to give. Um, we've got schools from the UK, USA, France, Spain, Ireland, Canada, and Bermuda joining us. So hello and welcome to every single one of you, whether you're watching from school or watching from home. Um, we've got year four at Acre Rig Academy, so fantastic to have you with us. Hi, everyone in uh, Acre Rig. I've uh, got Emmy, Posey, and Micah, um, who've got stinky cabbage indicator ready. Uh, massive apologies uh, to all homes and schools who've been stinked out uh, by making red cabbage a pH indicator, but fab that you've done it. Um, big hello to uh, Mrs. Dennison and Mr. John's class from Irby Primary. Wonderful to have you back. Uh, for this lesson and great uh, that all the students apparently have been working so, so hard um, this week. So great, great to hear. Um, great to have Noah and Lotta in Brittany, France. Hi, guys. Lovely to have you back for this lesson. Um, Sunny Cold Leatham, um, wonderful to have you guys back for this lesson on human impact. Uh, we've got Mistral, Sefer and Tempest classes at Edith Morehouse Primary School. Hi, everyone. Uh, Coverdale class at Richard Taylor Church of England Primary School in Harrogate. Hi. Um, <laughs> this is a question here, which is, we'll come to it in a while we're answering that. How's it to, to move about constantly? Uh, first the Arctic and now the Caribbean, and that's the Waterhouse Farm. It's a massive privilege to be able to experience these environments firsthand. Um, and weirdly, I, I almost prefer the cold of the Arctic to the warmth of the tropical coral reef. But that's that's just me. We can come on to that more later. Um, everyone in year seven at Penthorpe in West Sussex. Hi, guys. Lovely to have you. Um, class four at Westington Primary School in Derbyshire. Hi. Um, horse chestnut class at Farnham Primary School in Essex. Great to have you with us. Um, Project Plastic team from OLE Moore Primary School in Port Talbot. Wonderful, thank you for joining. 
and look forward to hearing more about the plastic work that you're doing at school and helping to preserve the environment. And a big shout out to Trimley St. Martin's School Year 5. And you're joining amazingly for your fourth lesson this week. Um, fab, keep up the, the hard work and hope um, you enjoy this lesson as well. So as I started off saying, this lesson is about human impact on the coral reef. And by some estimates, we've lost a sort of around half of the coral reef over the past decades. In the news, we often see reports of something called coral bleaching, and we'll come on to coral bleaching um, a little bit later. It does involve um, little sweets um, as a way of explaining it, just to make it uh, slightly more um, engaging. Uh, and then, but we're looking today at um, carbon dioxide and a process called ocean acidification. So what we're gonna do is look at how this amazing world is potentially threatened or is threatened by human activity. Yesterday, we looked at the food web and food chains, and we saw that if you just affect one part of an ecosystem, the whole ecosystem can fall down. So today, we're looking at uh, the coral um, itself and how it's being affected, and then remembering that coral reefs support 25% of all marine species. So we're going to look at something called ocean acidification. And we're going to do two activities. And I'm not going to explain too much up front because through demonstrating um, these activities, I think we'll get quite a clear understanding. The first activity we're going to do, and I'm just sort of rearranging a few things here, is we're going to look at the process of ocean acidification. So what you'll need for this is a straw, um, hopefully either a reusable or biodegradable straw, and a container with some just some tap water in it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what happens if we imagine this is our mini ocean, what happens if I add carbon dioxide to our mini ocean? And the way I'm going to add carbon dioxide is by blowing through the straw and the increased levels of carbon dioxide as I breathe out. I'm going to see what happens here and as I, as I add that gas to this water. What this activity investigation is all about is looking at change. Will the acidity level change? And um, acidity is something uh, that we can measure using natural indicators, such as the red cabbage dye, or with a pH meter. And it's, all it does is, I'm mean, getting complicated here already. So first of all, we've got this concept of acid and alkali. And you might um, have come across this in science already. So we've got sort of acid, acidic substances like lemon juice, coffee, tomatoes, uh, and then we've got more alkali um, substances like um, bleach. I'm trying to, and uh, it's probably milk. I'm sort of racking my brains here um, for, for relative, um, for good examples for 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 sort of this this level of class, um, and. What we want to see, and then in the sort of middle, we've got sort of water. And the way that we measure acidity in a substance is through something called pH. It's a bit like length, we have meters, weight, we have grams, acidity, we have pH. So it's the unit which we use to measure. Uh, pure water is pH 7. And tap water, because it has mineral, minerals in it, is going to be slightly higher. So the first thing I need to do if I'm measuring change is to look at the pH of my water here. Let's turn this on. And I'm not sure whether you can see this, but I have a pH of just over, over 
um, eight, just over eight there. And I've, I've just, uh, Ellie um, is telling me that we can't quite see it, but it's 8.05. You may be using uh, a different type of indicator, but just have a sense whether it's um, cabbage, um, water, fill up one cup and see the color of that. And then if you're using a different indicator, have a look. So what we're going to see now is if I add CO2 to my mini ocean, is the pH going to change? Is the acidity going to change? And we're thinking about this because of the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere. I'm going to do this for a minute. Uh, Ellie, who's producing, and Sim, who is moderating, are going to help me do my timing and everything else. Um, but I can't remember how long should I be blowing in, into this for? How we much no, of it? I think we we'll, normally do at least one minute. We'll do. We'll we'll try for one minute, and then we'll see what the difference is, and then we'll try try for a month, another minute. Uh, things to make sure. I need to make sure I don't do this. Don't blow too hard if you're doing this in the class. So don't. If you blow hard, you can splash water everywhere. So don't. Just gentle, constant. Remember to breathe. Um, don't pass out because you're just blowing out the whole time. You breathe and take a break and all those kind of things. Um, but what we're going to do is we're just going to blow into the this water for one minute. Do this. You can do this at the same time, and then we're going to see whether we can measure any change. So all together, is somebody ready to count me down? Okay. Uh -huh. Thirty seconds left. Thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two and one. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> so hopefully you've all had a go. Um, and what I'm going to do is going to get my pH meter out and give it time to settle. And can anyone remember on the live chat what 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 or Ellie? Can you remember what what we had to begin with? I eight point zero nine, I think. Um, I should be a very good scientist, and I should have written that down with my pen or my pad here before 8.09. Okay, so after one minute of bubbling through, uh, what do you reckon we've got to? Can I have your guesses, please, through on the live chat or on using the uh, chat button in the bottom right of the Encounter EDU website screen? So I can wonder whether we've got some of those coming up. So we started off at 8.09. Pure water, as I mentioned before, is pH 7. So we're going down. As something becomes more acidic, the pH decreases. And we're at a wonderful 6.2. 6.2, so we've gone down from 8.09 to 6.2. So, uh, apparently, we've had a guess of six, so somebody very, very close to the closest whole unit, which is amazing. 7.5, I did a bit better than that. I wonder how other people got on. So I won't blow through for, for another minute and, and bring it down even more. 10, 9.4. So just to, re just to review this, 
we have this scale called pH, which we use to measure acidity. As a substance gets more acidic or difference between different substances, we go lower. So something that is, uh, has a lower pH is more acidic. We've looked at our mini ocean. We've added carbon dioxide to our mini ocean. Through a chemical reaction, that carbon dioxide becomes carbonic acid. And we've seen and observed how that's happened over a blowing through this beaker of water for one minute. And by doing that, we've seen that the pH has gone from pH 8.09 to pH 6.22. So for me, the conclusion that I can draw from that is adding more carbon dioxide to an ocean, in this case, a mini ocean, or in the case of the world, by putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, this then dissolves into the ocean and changes its pH too. Now, since about 1750, the Industrial Revolution, when there's more industry, more carbon dioxide being created by the burning of fossil fuels, we've seen not only a change when we've measured carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but also a change in the pH of the ocean. And we've seen that go down by about 0.1 of a unit from about 8.2 to about 8.1. And that's an average across the world. So it's, the pH will be in different in different places like temperature. Um, but what we've seen is that global average, the pH go down by 0.1 of a unit. Now, that may not seem like very much, this 0.1, this one-tenth of a unit, but it represents a 30% increase in, in acidity over the past 270-odd years. And scientists have calculated or estimated that we've got a faster change in ocean acidification in terms of the rate of change than at any other point in the past 300 million years. But why does this matter? Why does it matter that the ocean chemistry is changing so fast? Well, then we need to think about coral and what happens if it's experienced or exposed to liquids or the water being more acidic. So I've got some tiny pieces of coral here. And these are bits that have snapped off exhibits um, at the National Marine Aquarium. And what we're going to see is what happens when these are exposed to an acidic substance. I'll just put this in here. So there they are in my beaker. And the last activity was really looking at predicting change and measuring change and taking measurements. This is this, we're just going to observe and see what happens. And the acidic substance I'm going to use is vinegar. It's my wonderful duct tape brand vinegar. And I'm going to add that uh, to, it's a bit smelly this lesson, isn't it? We've got cabbage water and vinegar. Um, Okay, add this to here. Okay. I'm going to hold it up and hopefully we'll be able to see something happening. And so just observe, and if you're doing this at school, you might be using bits of chalk. And chalk is made from the same mineral, calcium carbonate, as coral. So all we're doing is observing what happens and whether we think this might be great if you're a coral or not so great. 
if you recall. So what we've seen there, and I don't know whether you could see those bubbles, and I don't know whether you can see that with chalk or anything else or some old shells, bits of shells like this that you may have placed in vinegar, is we see there's a reaction between this chalky substance, whether it's the calcium carbonate making up a shell, the calcium carbonate making up a chalk. If you are using chalk, sometimes you need to break it up a bit because there's often a plastic coating around the outside to stop your fingers getting um, mucky. Um, or in this case, the coral and its calcium carbonate structure. And when that's put into a substance that's more acidic, such as uh, vinegar, we can see a reaction there. So what we've been looking at here is basically one of the human impacts on the reef. And that's a, driven by increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, caused by the burning of fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution. That carbon dioxide is absorbed into the ocean, which makes it more acidic, a lower pH. And we know that's a 30% increase in acidity over the past sort of 250, 270 years. And then that change in acidity, and the vinegar I'm using here is much more acidic than the ocean, or even as the ocean is projected in the next 100 years. But a change in the pH, a change in the acidity of the ocean has an impact on coral. We saw bubbling here. I don't think we quite see bubbling yet on the reef. But if there are any questions about this section, please put them on the live chat. But what I'm going to do now is bring in Sarah, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the pH and a little bit more about um, what kind of level of pH we could inspect and how corals may or may not respond to that. And I'd love it also if Sarah were to share some of her amazing work as well. So Sarah, are you, are you there? Hi, yes, I am. Uh, fantastic, Sarah. Thank you so much for being part of Active Coral Life. Fantastic to have you with us. Um, you will probably got a few hints and tips for me just to make sure that my science is completely up to date and accurate. Um, but can you just take us over... I've talked generally about this this pH scale thing. It would be great to if you can give us a little bit more detail on that, uh, not only with household objects that we might might know about, but also where our ocean sits in this scale now and in the future and potentially in the future. Hi, thank you for having me. So yes, um, pH is an incredibly important property of our oceans. And currently, as Jamie has already said, the ocean is sitting at about 8.1. So this means everything has decreased a little bit, but only by about 0.1 of a unit. And everything in the ocean is adapted to kind of work at a pH of this. So anything that is creating a skeleton or a shell, like a lobster or, or a mussels or corals, which produce this calcium carbonate skeleton. Now, I think um, we have a picture of a skeleton or what Jamie has also been holding up. So they need to be able to create these skeletons. They have to increase the pH of their internal um, body fluid. So to do this, they um, do a series of processes that increase their pH but as the pH of the ocean decreases, it makes it harder and harder for them to produce the skeleton. And they can continue to produce the skeleton as pH decreases, but there is a constant process of dissolution occurring at the same time, like what we saw when Jamie put the skeleton in the acidic, in the vinegar. Now this is constantly occurring. There is some dissolution always occurring, but there is also coral growth occurring and at the moment, and in the past, growth has been much greater than dissolution. But as this dis dissolution um, increases, it becomes harder and harder for the corals to fight back, basically, against the ocean pH. 
And this is when we start to see a decrease in coral growth and we start to see changes in our reef environment. Amazing, Sarah. So, so, so what, what we're saying is, is that going, going into the future, what, what kind of pHs can we expect? When, when might we see corals getting, I think you, you mentioned sort of more fragile, even if they're... Dioxide, by 2100, we'll see a further 0.3 decrease. So that's significantly more than we've seen. So as um, the way that pH works in the ocean, it's not a straight line. As um, carbon dioxide continues to go into the ocean, it's able to accept some of this CO2 without any change, but eventually we will see this pH decrease and it will decrease quicker and quicker. And that is what we're uh, predicting will happen if we don't reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So uh, it, it's, it sounds, sounds like a bit of a sort of doom and gloom sort of projection. We can come on in a bit to some of the questions and, and what we can do. But before we get to that section, the sort of, you know, basic sort of pH probe in a, in a beaker and in, in an aquarium and looking, observing rates of how a coral skeleton or a coral sort of like copes with different pHs. It, that, 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 that's something you do out in the, in the, in the real world. Yes, that's right. So I am currently doing my PhD in um, ocean acidification in Belize. So that's looking at how, so I'm going to, I'm spending four years looking at how pH changes might be occurring in Belize. So Belize is a country in Central America, and I think um, we do have a picture of where this is. So it's looking at a tropical location, and we're looking at how river inf impacts on the pH. So we've talked about atmospheric CO2, so the CO2 that we're emitting from burning of fossil fuels going into the atmosphere, but there is also other sources of CO2. So uh, into the coastal ocean, which is where a lot where tropical coral reefs are found. So I am looking at how a river um, may be bringing in high CO2 from inland and into the coastal ocean and which could affect um, the corals. So I'm doing this in two ways. I am using a lot of technology. So as um, the study of the ocean advances, technology is becoming more and more important to be able to study this. So um, my first uh, main tool is using an autonomous surface vehicle. So this is a small boat. It um, is about four meters long and it has a whole um, array of sensors on the bottom of it. So this, we're able to measure the surface chemistry of the water so we can see exactly how the, what the river may be bringing into the ocean and where this is going. So I think you've seen a video of this boat. And then the um, second tool that I'm using is a pH sensor that we situate on the reef. So this way we want to look at how pH is changing on the reef scale. So we're first looking at the surface chemistry to see what's changing that and then how the coral reef, um, how what the daily fluctuations in pH that we see. And actually, although we're talking about um, pH of 7.8 in the future, we already see these pHs as low as 7.8 on reefs globally. So we know that corals can withstand low pH because in their own environment, they um, have a changing pH throughout the day. We see this cycle. We see high pH during the day and low pH at night. And this is because there's a change in photosynthesis, which is when um, things like plants uh, consume CO2 and produce oxygen, like the oxygen that we breathe, which happens, we know this happens on land. This also happens in the oceans. And then at night, this photosynthesis shuts off and respiration, so breathing, produces CO2 and decreases pH. So we are already seeing low pHs on reefs. We know that they can withstand them, but it's whether they can withstand low pH um, in decreasing further and also the number of other stressors that are affecting the reefs. Amazing, Sarah. Thanks so much. And and how how do you how do you sort of measure the impact on the coral itself? I mean, do you, do you sort of take photographs, or do you sort of like put them in a lab and sort of do experiments on them? So 
in my research, what I'm looking at is um, we want to see if the pH at different reefs around the world is changing in the same way throughout the day and night. But also using that autonomous vehicle that we showed a video of, and um, we can map the reef. So we're using um, bathymetric or seafloor imagery to look at does the composition so is it big corals small corals branching corals does that change along the reef and can that be related um to the reef health i mean it sounds like absolutely fascinating work we've got a, a huge stack of questions um from from young people um, across the world uh, very concerned uh, about the reef and learning about the reef, and, and, and let's let's look at some hope towards <laughs> towards the end. Uh, but the first question is from is from Edith Morehouse Primary and Richard Taylor of Church of England Primary, um, uh, and it's just just this basic endangered word. Um, how much you know? Is how many coral reefs are endangered? What types of coral are endangered? Is it is it everywhere? Um, no, but what, what, what's happening? Unfortunately, reefs everywhere are in danger. It doesn't mean they're all declining at the same rate. We see um, reefs where there's maybe less human impact, less fishing, less um, disturbance. These reefs are able to withstand other impacts better. So what we can learn from these reefs is that if we reduce things like fishing, it can help the reef to withstand other changes such as ocean acidification. So I know certainly on Curacao, the east, the east point, there is a protected area and that's a much, much healthier reef than the other, other points on, on, on around the island. Um, Noah and Lotta, Lotta in Brittany in France um, would like to know, it's a great question, sort of, can you single out the biggest threat uh, to coral reefs? Um, the biggest threat to coral reefs, I would say, is the rising CO2 because it affects the corals in two ways. We've talked about ocean acidification, decreasing pH, but rising CO2 is causing warming temperatures. And so the, it's a double-edged sword, basically, for the corals. They're being hit at two angles because of this increasing CO2. So being able to reduce our own carbon footprint and the CO2 that's in the atmosphere is key to kind of protecting them. Yeah, you, you mentioned ocean warming there as, as being a threat uh, to corals. Uh, I, I've, I've got a, I've got a um, coral skeleton here, which, which is why we've got this thing called coral bleaching. Um, and by, by way of um, algae, I have, I have some little sweeties um, like this. Um, and so what we're saying here is that the, the, this coral polyp, I think this is, I think this is a mushroom coral, um, gets its color uh, from algae, and we covered this on, on Monday, that algae lives, that lives inside its, its tissue. So if you didn't have the algae inside its tissue, it would kind of be a sort of whitish color. Uh, and as the ocean gets, I'm relying on Sarah to tell me how I'm doing here. Um, as the ocean gets warmer or, or goes above its sort of normal level, um, by about one degree for maybe a you know just a, a, a few few days and the the algae sort of basically the the relationship breaks down and the algae leaves and the reason why it's called bleaching is you can see when those colored algae leaves then we've got this white uh color remaining and that doesn't kill the coral directly but if you remember that we spoke about tropical coral getting 70 to 90 percent of its energy from but the, the sugars produced by this algae now if those leave then it's got 70 to 90 percent less food and so it's on a slow starvation so if we see that warm temperature lasting for maybe more than sort of like three four weeks then you can start to get um coral mortality if the temperature decreases in time then we get then we get the algae coming back in, and the uh, the coral can recover. How was that? Yes, that was really good. <laughs> Great um, explanation. Thank you. So that that's coral bleaching. So we so as Sarah was saying, the carbon dioxide has this twin twin impact. Um, so Penthorpe School was asking what will be the 
effect of global warming. And so hopefully that, that's, that's covered some of that. There, there will be Im- warming impacts on other species, but in terms of coral directly, that's the coral bleaching is, is the, main, the main issue we're looking at. Um, Deji from Year 6 Farnham Church of England Primary um, asks, is algae one of the reasons that coral reefs are dying? And I think that we'll, we'll leave the sort of algae inside the coral tissue um, to one side. But in terms of sort of algae, slimy reefs, perhaps, Sarah, you could talk a little bit about um, that in, in terms of, you know, does algae seaweed harm coral reefs? That's a great question. So algae itself doesn't harm the coral reefs. But what happens when things like bleaching occur and the corals maybe die or they're weaker, it allows the algae to take over. So algae can grow very fast and it wants a hard substance to grow on. So rocks or coral skeletons are great for it to grow. So it can start to grow and take over. And what um, and so while it's not causing the decline in coral reefs, it makes it very difficult for the corals, if they are recovering, to be able to continue to grow because there is algae everywhere. And we see this a lot in the Caribbean. And it's particularly in reefs that have been overfished because the fish, a lot of the fish there will eat algae. And if there's not very many fish to eat the algae, um, then the algae continues to grow. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, it was a great question um, coming in there from, from Farnham. Uh, Emma, Posey and Michael, who, who I think are, are, are homeschooled, um, it's a wonderful question. Um, have you seen any adaptations uh, that coral or sea life has because of this change in, in pH? That's a great question. Now, I have to think about that for a second. Um, I guess some of the adaptation, going back to the last question, tying that together, what they've seen in some places is if there's lots of macroalgae or... Um, is that seaweed, big seaweedy type stuff? Seaweed or seagrass or just quite a lot of algae. This can actually... Um, it's photosynthesizing. So it's taking in the CO2 and producing oxygen. And what we've seen is that reefs that are downstream from this, so where the water is moving from the macroalgae down to the coral, the effects of ocean acidification have been reduced because of this algae decreasing CO2. So while we talk about the algae being bad in terms of space availability for the corals, it can actually help to reduce how much CO2 or how acidic the water is. That's really interesting. So almost if we plant a seagrass meadow um, upstream of a coral reef and those two habitats, the two ecosystems can, can, can help each other out. Absolutely. And that's why seagrass meadows are so important. I mean, we see seagrass a lot where coral reefs are, but a lot of them have been disturbed, have been removed for so that the sand is clear and the water is more turquoise. Um, but they are so important to be consuming this CO2 and helping the corals. It's a really interesting, more connectivity uh, on the reef. Um, so we have here, how much coral has disappeared in the last year? Um, how much coral is destroyed each day? Um, these, are, these are from um, Edith Morehouse Primary and, and Trinity St. Martin School. Um, I, mean, I think we've, we've looked generally at the sort of 50% loss over the past 30 years, we have, um, and I can't remember the exact figures, we have some great measurements coming from the Great Barrier Reef, some really good data there from the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, who do a survey of different sections of the Great Barrier Reef. And particularly now, it seems to be because of the what we call these mass bleaching events, um, where these sort of larger surges of warmer water are cause, causing a lot, lot more damage. Do, 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 do we have the ability to measure on a sort of daily basis or is it this sort of more annual, sort yeah. of longer term scales? Daily, measuring on a daily basis um, is not something I think is easily done because we don't know when the corals, so they might, you know, they get rid of this algae inside of them, but there is the opportunity for the algae to come back, for them to recover. So as soon as they lose it, it doesn't mean they're dead. It just means they are 
almost ill, as it were, and they have a chance to recover. So measuring it on a daily scale, I would say is not necessarily fair to the corals. It doesn't give them a good enough fighting chance to recover. Um, but we are able to measure on longer scales, years to decades to see this change. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, there's, there's, there's some more questions on vulnerability of coral. There's more questions on, on sort of polluted areas of the ocean. I, we've, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, very sadly, it was great. I, I wanted to sort of like focus on three questions, uh, three or four questions, which is really about um, can coral regrow um, in areas where, where it's dying? Yes, they can regrow. Um, and they've seen them when you, in Florida, they've seen small bits of coral being replanted and it recovering. Uh, can coral repair itself? Yes, because it's individual organisms creating a colony, they can continue to grow um, if there is some of the colony left. So what we're saying is given the right conditions, that coral can kind of sort itself out a bit. Yes, if we um, help it to have optimum or very good conditions, um, it can start to recover. Brilliant. So there's lots of people asking, so what are those things that we all need to do or what can we, what can people do in the classroom? What can we do as individuals, as schools to start to create these conditions where coral can, can, can sort of restore itself and, and regrow? So as we talked about, the biggest impact is carbon dioxide. So it's anything that we can do to reduce our own carbon dioxide emissions. This would include walking more, not taking a uh, car transport or reducing the number of times you go on a plane or thinking about where your food might be coming from. Food that is transported from the other side of the world has a lot more carbon dioxide released um, than food that's produced locally. And this also goes for things like meat, which have much higher carbon dioxide emissions related to it than if you were to eat plants. Additionally, things like um, fishing. We've talked about how fishing can have an impact on reefs. So thinking about where the fish you are eating or how much fish you are eating, um, where that comes from or how you can reduce it as well. Amazing. So think about how you travel, uh, how you eat and how you live. So if you're a class looking to reduce your impact, I suggest just pick one of those. <laughs> Don't do everything at once. Pick one of those three. And just, just reflect on those practices and do some research to find out if there are alternatives or different ways you can do things uh, that reduce your carbon impact. Um, amazing. Um, one last question, I know I'm very sadly this lesson's come to an end, is how, how do you cope with working emotionally with work, working on coral in, in this time of loss? That's a very good question. And sometimes I have to admit it's harder than others. But I think um, that it's so important to understand all these processes. And the research that I'm looking at and looking at rivers is very much understudied. So if we can show, I mean, I'm driven by the fact that if I can show that a river is having an effect on corals, then uh, the Belize as a country can make changes inland. So there is still hope for corals, um, but it is very much... I guess is a race against time. So I am driven by hoping to find, helping to be able to find uh, answers through science to uh, protect or reduce the impacts that corals are facing. Amazing. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so, so much. And just to reiterate, uh, coral reefs still recover. There's some great examples of community projects of marine protection, of community fishing agreements, of whole countries moving towards net zero, of schools banning plastic and reducing the impact. So many people around the world are making a difference and the natural world can rebound. So don't give up. Uh, thank don't, give up. don't give up. Uh, massive amount of hope. Um, but if you see something that's wrong, it is okay to be outraged and share that outrage and, and look for a better way forward. Thank you so much uh, to everyone watching. Um, it's been fantastic to have you um, a part of Coral Live. If there are questions that we didn't get to, we'll, we'll, we will try and answer some of those in the, in the next session as well. Um, so do um, try and see that on catch up.
and we'll try and get to all the questions. Sarah, thank you so, so much uh, for being part of Coral Live uh, for this lesson. Until the next time, we, we'll be back on Monday for the, for the final uh, primary school session um, of, of elementary school session of, of Coral Live, and that's uh, then Life of Scientists, and that's with the sponge specialist, Ben. So we're going to be learning all about sponges with Ben, and Ben's down in the Caribbean at the moment. But until then, have a great weekend, and it's goodbye from Coral Live. Bye-bye.